Okay. Hi everyone and welcome to the Latte Lounge um, Zoom Live and tonight I've got uh, Dr. Philippa Kay with us, our resident GP. Hi Philippa, lovely to have you on. Um, and we are talking about back to school anxiety tonight um, because a lot of children are going to be going back to school. Some have gone back today, some are going back tomorrow and most of the rest of the UK next week. Um, so before we start, um, obviously if, um, Philippa can't give um, any personal um, health um, advice or answer any personal questions, um, but we are going to be talking very much about Q&A, uh, sorry, about COVID anxieties. So thanks Philippa for joining us. Um, You're welcome. <laughs> so look, at, you know, as a mum of four, um, I, I feel everybody's pain. We've all been in lockdown for a very, very long time. And I think a lot of parents um, and children are rightly anxious about what school is gonna be like. Um, so I just wanted to ask you, you know, if there's anything that you could sort of advise people on about how we can prepare kids, you know, especially, well, it's not just especially young kids, but, but all kids, teenagers, you know, even uni students about what to expect and, and how to kind of cope with the nerves. So I think the first thing to do is to talk about that all feelings are acceptable um, and that your feelings are valid, whatever they are, even if somebody else might disagree with them. Um, and so it's perfectly understandable to have some anxiety about your kids going back to school and for them to have anxiety themselves. Now, how you would talk to a three year old is obviously very different to how you talk to a 15 year old. But the first thing that I would say that school holistically is absolutely the best place, the best place for children to be, not just for them to learn the three R's, the reading, writing, arithmetic and whatever else that they may learn, but also for their physical and their psychological development. Um, and essentially, if you think about childhood as a place of development towards independence, some of that needs a separation from us as parents. Um, and school plays a huge part of that. And all the things that they learn in school, including the social aspects, are hugely important. And when we talk about something like coronavirus, we talk about the direct costs, but the indirect costs are just as important. And if we were to stay in lockdown forever, we'd begin to outweigh the risks of corona. And so that needs to be applied when it comes to school as well. So what I would be saying, though, and I would say this to reassure you as much as to reassure your children, is that schools are doing everything that they can in order to reduce transmission. And I can go through some of those things in order that you can tell your child about them. So children are going to be housed in bubbles. Now, depending on the size of your school and the age of your child, that might be in a class size and it might be in a year group and it might be in a key stage group. So they might, some schools might put years 10 and 11, for example, um, together, key stage school. Um, and then in that group, they will be doing as much as they can together. Now in primary school, that's a lot easier. Um, so you put, I don't know, year three in one classroom with their teacher and they stay there and they don't wander about the school in the way that perhaps they might have done before. And in lots of primary schools, they're having staggered drop off and pick up times, staggered lunch times and things like that. In secondary school, there may well be less movement around than there have been in other years. So it might be that a lot of your classes are um, in one classroom or in two or three where that whole year group can move around in just that very small area to keep them together. In secondary schools only um, it's up to the head teachers sort of making a decision about how big their school is, how big the, the corridors are, how well ventilated they are but lots of secondary schools are saying that your child will need to wear a mask during those communal um, movement times, but um, masks are not to be worn in class. And then there's gonna be an awful lot of hand washing. And so if you've got young kids, um, there's been a lot of teaching them how to wash their hands at home and how to do it for 20 seconds with running water and soap. And there's gonna be an awful lot of that at school as well. 
I know. I mean, it, I just can't even imagine how it's actually going to pan out, especially in these big schools with 2,000 pupils and the sort of 30 in a class. I just, you know, I think it's a worry, but, you know, it's out of our hands. But I think, you know, obviously what I've been thinking about is what happens in a, say, you know, you've got a class of 30. What happens if there's one positive case? Is that entire class going to then be asked to stay at home for two weeks? Will it shut the entire school down? I mean, you know, okay. these are my so, <laughs> The first thing, um, the other thing that I sorry, wanted to say was that children are incredibly resilient, incredibly resilient and able to deal with change in far greater a way than often we give them credit for. Um, and they will manage. And it might take a little bit of getting used to, but they will manage it. Um, now, the rules are if you are unwell or if anybody in your household has symptoms of coronavirus, no one in that household should be going to school. So no temperature in the morning and have a little bit of paracetamol and see if you're okay. We shouldn't be doing that anyway. I know that some parents do. Um, if anybody in your household is unwell, the person who is unwell has to stay at home for 10 days. The rest of the household is 14 days. But actually, I would recommend that you go and get a test because if your test is negative, then you can go out. If your child becomes unwell in school, you will be rung to pick them up from school and they will have to stay at home for 10 days. If you go and get a test and that test is positive, um, then everybody in your household will have to stay in for 14 days and the bubble will be sent home. But they won't be sent home until that test result comes back. And if the test is negative, then the bubble stays at school. But let's say that you your test is negative, but you're still unwell and you're, you've got a fever and diarrhea and vomiting. The normal school rules would apply that we don't want you to go back. But the fact that one person is unwell doesn't automatically mean the whole bubble has to go home. It's only if um, that person then tests positive that there would be a reaction for the rest of the bubble. And Public Health England would be informed if there seems to be some kind of outbreak within a school to see whether or not um, different measures would have to apply. And that would is the same that would be true if there was an outbreak of, I don't know, scarlet fever or something else within a school. Right. I mean, there's a lot of mixed me I mean they're not mixed messages probably to you they probably seem straightforward but there's a lot of hysteria I mean I know in our sort of you know local communities there's a few kids who've tested positive and other kids who have been with them um, and everybody is kind of doing their own track and trace and questioning and I've noticed a lot of uh, pressure on children and parents and phone calls sort of almost accusingly adding to the kind of anxiety of these poor children uh, what's going on what should I do what shouldn't I do um, you know a lot of kids don't have symptoms but they've um, I and mean, they may not have been sort of um, contacted by track and trace um, and everybody's kind of doing their own guesswork so can I just if if you're tested negative is that only negative for that day or does it, you know, sort of count for the next day? Because that's, that's where I don't kind of get it. And I've got a lot of emails from people asking the same question. So it's possible um, that if you take a test too early, so I coughed twice and I had a test, that that test is going to be negative and then it's going to actually be positive when you're properly unwell. Um, but if you test, if you are unwell with a fever, cough, loss of taste or sense of smell um, and you test negative, it, do, it isn't predictive for the future. What I think that your question might be about is, if somebody in my house is positive mm. and I test negative, am I okay to go out? Yes. And the answer to that is no. Mm. So if you have somebody in your household who tests positive, all the other members of the household have to stay in for 14 days. Mm -hmm. And that is because you could be incubating the virus. And so if you test negative on day one, that doesn't protect, tell me what's going to happen on day three, five, seven, eleven. Mm. So if anybody in your household tests positive, the whole household stays in for 14 days. If you then develop symptoms, 
then you have to stay in for 10 more days after your symptoms start if you then test positive. So let's say that, I don't know, your husband tests positive on day one and you don't get symptoms until day 13 and your test is positive on day 13, you're staying in for 23 days in total. So 10 days after your symptoms appear. Mm -hmm. That's quite a long time and I appreciate that. Now the other thing that is definitely, I appreciate the rules that have been changing and, and that they can be confusing, is what happens if I'm contacted by track and trace. Mm -hmm. So if you have been in close contact with somebody who then tests positive, you will be phoned by track and trace. That person has to stay in for 14 days but the rest of their household does not. Mm -hmm. So I live in household A. Somebody in my household, in household A, tests positive. The whole of household A stays in for 14 days. But some, the person in my household A who tested positive has been in contact with someone in household B. That person in household B will be contacted by track and trace. And that person only in household B has to stay in for 14 days. They do not need to get a test because the test, as we said, could be negative on day one and positive 13 days later. Right. Well, I hope that's clear, everyone, because I know there's a lot of questions. Um, there's a question from Daniela, but you may have answered it. Let me just quickly read it. What about if one of my children's friends tests positive, but my child takes a test and tests negative, but could test positive in a few days? Are they not in the same household, but they have seen each other? Oh, I think you've answered that, <laughs> having read that. Can you see that? Yes, okay. Tara said we need... No, I think she said that she... <laughs> Says you need yeah, a I, I yeah, you, you need a degree to understand it. I totally appreciate that. I think at the beginning, it was really clear. Stay home, stay safe, protect yeah. the NHS. And now, now it is a lot harder. Um, but I would say that I see a lot of, or I hear on the phone um, from a lot of patients who say, oh, but I think it's teething. Or I think they've just got a cold. I, it can't be corona. I, you know, I, I'm fine for this person, my child to go out. You don't know. No. And I know it's a pain when it could be a cough, a normal um, cough and cold that we're going to get coming into the winter and flu season. And it is disruptive. But those are the rules and we have to follow them. Absolutely. Um, t talk to me. I I'm noticing, first of all, I'm sitting in the dark. Can you all see me? Because I might put some background lighting on while you <laughs> answer this question. Um, Short and long term effect on mental health. What What are your thoughts on that? And just excuse me while I put a light on. I know this is not very professional, but I want people to be able to see. Any better? No. Anyway. <laughs> so, excuse me. Um, so, there are the effects on mental health of having COVID 19 itself. Um, we know that there is always an effect on your psychological health when you are physically unwell. The two are inextricably linked. Yeah. Um, but there has definitely been a huge psychological burden of the pandemic in general. And I think that everybody has felt that. There has been, especially at the beginning, there was a huge level of anxiety. And then as the rules began to relax, actually, and things began to change, that anxiety also began to peak again. Um, because we all sort of got used to living up in a certain way, and then they moved the, the, the fence posts, and that's difficult. Yeah. Add to that adolescence, which is what our children are dealing with, and the effects of hormones on the developing brain, plus the effect of this stress on the developing brain, that's really significant and shouldn't be underestimated. And they would have picked up on all the other anxieties that are going to be around in so many houses related to worrying about loved ones, worrying about grandparents, worrying about people who are ill, worrying about financial stability, worrying about your job. And actually, our children will pick up on a lot of these. And I would say the most important thing that you can do is keep talking. But if you are really concerned that you or one of your household isn't managing, then please do contact your GP. And, you know, it, I, everybody is just sort of hanging around waiting and praying for this sort of magic vaccine. How, how likely, in your opinion, is it that we're going to see it? We're all going to be vaccinated and we're all going to go back to our, our lovely lives that we got so used to last year. 
So I think it's funny, lots of us have been hanging on till the 1st of September. In September, everything will be normal, <laughs> and, yeah. and it's the 2nd of September. Um, and I think that schools going back is definitely a big thing about sort of what feels more normal. Um, I hate the phrase new normal, but there is going to be a new normal for a while. Um, I think there is going to be a vaccine. I want to be proved wrong that it will be here before Christmas. Um, I think that next year is more realistic um i would be more than happy to be proved wrong about it but not everybody is going to get vaccinated straight away um, and i think that's quite important to manage expectations is that we will vaccinate the most vulnerable people first and the people who are going to be spreading it so we will be vaccinating the elderly those who are on the shielding list as long as we know actually that the vaccine works in those groups because and the immune system of an elderly person or the immune system of somebody who is immunocompromised, for example, they are taking immunosuppressants because they've had an organ transplant, may respond differently to a vaccine. So we need to know the answers before we give. Um, but those would be the groups that we would vaccinate first. And we would also be vaccinating care home workers and um, healthcare professionals in order to stop spread. So those people will be vaccinated first, I would imagine, before the rest of the population is. Mm -hmm. And I mean, obviously, while well, we're all waiting for that, in terms of children, you know, I, I want to go back to children because I know a lot of kids are going back tomorrow. You know, for the kids that do get it, is it true that the symptoms are pretty mild, you know, within a certain age group? Because there is a lot of fear. You know, the, uh, us parents have been going, don't touch that, don't do that, you're going to get COVID. And actually, a lot of kids are lucky that they haven't yet been exposed to anyone, you know, that's had it. So there's a lot of fear at this sort of bogeyman's out there but but what what's the sort of you know realistically you know so i think that that it's important to reassure our children that of all the demographic groups of all the socioeconomic and demographic groups that there are children do the best they do the best with this they are most likely more likely to be asymptomatic they are more likely to have very very mild symptoms um, and they are the least likely to end up in hospital with complications yes unfortunately there have been a very 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 few tragic um, deaths and i don't belittle that in any way but those numbers are tiny and we should all be reassured by that and actually, I would be reassuring your children as well that if they were to get it, that they're going to be fine. Mm. I think it's more that it, they're, they're going to be fine, but it's the knock on effect to, I guess, the parents and the grandparents. And, you know, I think that's the, you know, the main anxiety. Um, and and well, I think, I think, oh, I'm sorry. I think that that is true. But we also know that children don't seem to be transmitting this in the same way that they transmit flu. So for flu, for example, they are definitely super spreaders. Um, but for COVID-19, they don't seem to be spreading in the same way. Oh. So I would still be reassured from that point of view. However, unless you are in a support bubble, you shouldn't be hugging your grandparents anyway. Yeah. So we should be keeping our distance both outside and inside. It's only if you've made a support bubble um, that you uh can then sort of hug and kiss and and be really close and it's those things that increase your risk of transmission okay um i've got two more things to say because i know we've only got a you know if, how long we've got about five ten minutes left and and i just want to see if anyone wants to ask questions um i i know we're here to talk about children going back to school but i'm also very aware that our facebook group is is also there to look after us women now um I am finally over 50, not over 40 anymore, and I got a letter inviting me for a flu jab for the first time in my life, and so did my husband, and it made me feel very, very old. Why are they, <laughs> why are they doing, why are you encouraging us to have flu jabs, uh, and you know, is, is that, to, to, it doesn't prevent COVID, I assume it's just to prevent us getting flu. 
So um, this year, the flu vaccination program has changed for both adults and children. And for the adults, definitely, that's probably, well, not definitely, but I think that that's probably related to um, the impact of corona. So this is who's, who's eligible this year. It will be all two and three year olds, all primary school age children and children in year seven as well will be offered the nasal flu vaccine. So no jab for them. Um, anybody over the age of 50, it used to be over the age of 65, but now it's anybody over the age of 50. Anybody with a chronic medical condition, a chronic respiratory, chronic res um, kidney, chronic neurological condition, and all uh, things like that, and all pregnant women. So the huge difference in numbers is actually uh, the people between 50 and 64. Now, there's various reasons for that, um, but essentially the combination of flu and coronavirus has the potential to put the NHS under really significant strain this winter. It also has the potential to be really disruptive to your life, flu does. Um, and this year, if you get a fever, you can't just stay at home. You're going to have to stay at home. Your whole household's going to have to stay at home and you are going to have to get a test. Mm -hmm. um, so I would be saying that we don't want to have any unnecessary infections. If you are eligible for the flu jab, please do have it. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm sure there are lots of you. Has anybody um, got any questions? There is one that's just come through. If you don't mind me looking through on my phone. Um, so she's just saying, is the situation, sorry, this is Samantha, is the situation with nursery schools the same as the situation with primary and secondary schools? Will the bubbles be the same? Um, are little children more likely to get more sick? Not quite, right. So um, I don't know exactly how big your bubble will be. It will depend on the size of your nursery um, and, and there's various aspects that decide um, exactly how big your bubble will be. Um, I would contact the nursery for more information. Little children aren't more likely to get sick. Um, even babies aren't more likely to get sick. As I said, younger children are, do actually do the best um, out of all groups. So I would be reassured by that. Um, from the point of view of school, school is your first port or, or nursery. I would ask them what they're doing and I would most probably um, expect a long list of things to come back of how much more often the school is being cleaned, including things like, you know, the banisters being cleaned three or four times a day because that's a high touch point area um, and things like that. And often there is, I mean, I've seen the list that's came from my school, but um, also I've seen other schools and, and it's quite impressive what they are doing. So everybody is really doing their best to reduce that risk of transmission to your children and between them. And you have a job too, um, which is that we have to also be encouraging that really good hand hygiene that you sneeze into a tissue and um, discard the tissue and wash your hands, or if there's no tissue available, into your elbow um, and then wash your hands. Okay, I've got one more and then I think we, we need to wrap it up. Um, this is Beatrice. Um, my daughter is nine years old. She's been crying all day today. She won't let go of me. She's refusing to go to school tomorrow because she's scared of COVID. What can I say to her tonight? Oh. So I think that that separation anxiety is, is really common. And actually, as a mum, I think it probably affects us as well as it affects them. Um, mm -hmm. And we've been very used to having them around us constantly for six months. And yes, I would really love to go to the toilet on my own. Um, but it's <laughs> going to be strange when I finally get to do that. <laughs> and and I think that that's normal. And I think that, 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 that if you're anxious, she'll be picking up on some of that anxiety too. Mm -hmm. I would say to her, that she is as safe as, as you know as as they are as they can make it right now and that even if she were to get it that she is not likely to get very sick and then I would emphasize all the great positives about school that she's going to get to see her friends that she's going to get to play in the playground she's going to get to do all of those things that she has missed over the last few years a few years few months, few months. and exactly. that the teachers are going to be really aware of their children's anxiety and um, that I know that there are children who are worried oh my goodness am I so far behind has everybody got ahead of me has everybody been doing stuff and I haven't or I have and um, teachers are aware and they'll work it out that's what their jobs are their jobs are 
to work out where the gaps are and ensure that every child catches up. And right now, I imagine in the first week, there's going to be a lot of sort of togetherness and bonding stuff and rebuilding that group and those friendship groups. They know that our children have had a difficult time and they are on your side to make this transition as easy as it can be. Absolutely. Now, it's a beautiful question, which I didn't set up at all, but I was going to play a song to sing us out, which Philippa might know about. Um, this is not a shameless plug, but it will help your uh, daughter, the, the lady that just asked the question. Um, this is a group of teenagers called Generation Z who got together during lockdown to sing a song about their mental health anxieties. Um, and the song is called Strong, and you guys can get your children to download it on Spotify and iTunes, and there's a lovely video on YouTube. And the reason I'm talking about it is not because one of the 10 is my youngest ch um, children, but it's, it is such a beautiful song. And a lot of schools are going to be playing it on day one, and they're gonna be talking about um, that it's normal. You know, as Philippa, you've just said that these anxieties are normal. I mean, I feel it as a mum as well. Um, and I just think it would be a really lovely and positive way to sort of end our chat. Um, but so before I play it, I just wanted to thank you, honestly, so, so much. Um, it's really helpful. It really, really is. Um, and I just hope, I hope your children go back to school happily and everyone who's watching, they go back happily. Um, and if there's any questions, guys, I'm going to save this video now. I'm gonna load it onto our website and we are going to save it. Oh, someone said, thank you very much. We are going to save it um, on the Facebook group so everybody on the group can watch it. So thank you so much, Philippa, and I'm gonna play us out. I feel like a radio DJ with this beautiful song. <laughs> I hope you can all hear it. It's a little bit funny how the life that we once knew has disappeared from view. We gotta breathe in and take the pain. We will climb and rise again. We gotta stay calm and ride the storm together. We gotta fight now and we'll come through. We all know what we got.
stay strong.